Amen. Amen. Good morning, friends. I greet you in the name of Jesus, the revolutionary, and I bring you greetings from the Concord Baptist Church of Christ in Brooklyn, New York. And I would like to offer a personal note. First, a thank you to the reader of the scripture this morning. I know it was difficult to end on that note. I ask that you might be praying benevolent prayers while I'm standing here. I'm asking genuinely that you send strength. As someone who is queer, as someone who would love to be a parent someday, as someone who is quite familiar with the thumbprint of slavery on her own family's history, today is hard, y'all. And yet, the Supreme Court is doing what it was designed to do, which is to protect the rights and interests of US-born, cishet, white, able-bodied men who own property. The rest of us are an asterisk. So today I draw strength from every single warrior in my bloodline and from the Holy Spirit herself, who is so funny. <laughs> this scripture was actually chosen many months ago and it was settled with Pastor Matthews a few weeks ago. And I take this as a sign that the struggle is eternal even though it ought not be. Even when we lack the ability ourselves, I believe that the spirit intercedes on our behalf. So let us time travel into the text, which has already been so wonderfully read. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor they built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The, Is the Egyptians subjected the Israelites to hard servitude and made their lives bitter with hard servitude, in mortar and bricks and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The title of this sermon is, You Ain't Imagining It. In 1998, Disney put out a film that would accidentally radicalize an entire generation of children, <laughs> self-included. It was called A Bug's Life. Great movie, great film. It was a modern take on the old fable, the grasshoppers and the ants. Long story short, the ants are laboring all summer, learning to gather enough food for themselves, for the present moment, for the future moment where they're hibernating, and a portion for the grasshoppers. On a seasonal basis, the grasshoppers would collect their tax and descend upon the ant colony after a year of doing nothing, only to take this food from the hard-working ants. This is the way of life until the ants realize this is a scam. Yeah. Hopper, the king of the grasshoppers, tells on himself in an iconic speech. You let one ant stand up to us, and they all stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one, and if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. 
It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. Well, that's the sermon, folks. Thanks, everyone, for coming. <laughs> but to be real, this is where we meet the people of this text. We have a cruel oppressor, a community of targeted people, a dynamic of exploitation for the sake of dehumanizing people. Or I suppose in the ant's case, it would be deanticizing them. <laughs> but here's what's going on. A king rises to power who doesn't know Joseph or his faith. A king becomes intimidated by the numbers of those he enslaves. A king decides and conspires with similar folk to deal shrewdly with the masses lest they present a challenge. In the case of war, a king decides to set bosses over them to oppress them with forced labor. A king calls for the construction of Amazon and Walmart factory towns, supply cities, and a king notices that the Israelites just keep growing and the Egyptian army and vigilantes and sympathizers begin to show up at drag brunches and story hours and libraries and schoolyards because they're just so tired of these people sullying the Egyptian way of life. And so the king forces the Israelites to work hard. He makes their lives bitter. They wake up, they clock in, they make bricks and buildings and new luxury condos they'll never be able to live in. Ruthless. It's not about food, says Hopper. It's about keeping those ants in line. The first thing you are not imagining is this, that big power is so afraid of people power. We are a threat. The king tells on himself, he says, come, let us deal shrewdly with them or else they will increase in the event of war. Of course, he says these things because the text is clear to note that Pharaoh does not know Joseph. Now, some of us may know Joseph. This is the one who was sold into slavery and incarcerated, and somehow, through a wonderful dream, he's able to save the nation from famine through the dreams that he interprets. Pharaoh doesn't know that God loves Joseph and Joseph's people, and that God helped him feed an entire nation and its neighbors with surplus. Pharaoh doesn't know Joseph or his story or his people. Pharaoh is quick to erase the story of the people's liberation from history books and school curricula. Pharaoh has one button to push and one button only. And had Pharaoh known Joseph and his story, he might not resort to violent means of leading. But this is not about Joseph because Pharaoh only knows war. He only knows imperialism, and these are t tools to just do two things, to amass international power and to control your own citizens. So kings and presidents and senators know that the way to maintain power is to keep us oppressed so that we fall in line. At the bottom line of every budgetary decision is Pharaoh's reminder that in the case of war, they will join our enemies. What does it feel like to be dealt with shrewdly? It looks like eager military recruiters at college night in black and brown neighborhoods. Somehow those recruiters don't know the way to Phillips Exeter or Trinity or Spence. To be dealt with shrewdly is this, to grow up and enter a public school building that treats you like you are at Rikers. To be at Rikers and to be treated like something other than human. To be told and finger wagged that you should eat healthier so that your doctors can take your complaints about your own body seriously. And then your grocery store is a target of violence. To be dealt with shrewdly is to watch the city invest in stadiums, not public transit. To watch cities invest in school cops and not guidance counselors. 
to have all the money in the world for war, none for COVID tests. The key word is shrewdly. So imagine the posture of the billionaire Mr. Burns as he hunches over, looking at his plan. Excellent, the plan is working. The second thing that you are not imagining is that it actually really is terrible out there. If the Bible is useful for nothing else, there are a few truthful narrators. They were ruthless in all the tasks they imposed on them. These narrators help us to trust our own intuition about our own lives. The issues in our world are not fake, or imagined, or over-exaggerated, or in our heads, somebody is actually making your life bitter. Look at how much it costs to feed a family of four today, compared to two months ago, compared to six months ago. What's interesting about this sentence in the text is that it's not clear who the they is. Is it the taskmaster? Is it the king and his administration? Is it some nebulous body that gets activated in online chat rooms? We don't know. But we do know that there is at least someone out there making life bitter. Sometimes that's enough for me to breathe. As much as we have a responsibility to create and imagine the world that we want, it is important to see what's happening right now. But you already know there are gonna be people who minimize what you're feeling and seeing and experiencing. They're gonna tell you positive vibes only, dude. They're gonna tell you to manifest peace. They're gonna ask you to book their absurdly priced workshop so they can tell you how to have a better life. They're going to promise you something that they simply cannot give you. By all means, my friends, please journal. Read the self-help books, and there's an asterisk there. Read the ones written by the people who have the actual expertise and the training and have some sense. Don't just read everybody's book, because everybody's book is not worth reading. <laughs> It's just true stuff. Yeah. But there are some things that you cannot self-help. You can't just spiritually bypass all of the stuff that's kicking you in the pants. It's not bad vibes. It's the edict of the king. It's not bad vibes. It's capitalism, baby. Yeah. And whenever there is a need, please believe that there will be people pretending to be good people, who are ready to exploit it. Shame on all those who use pain, including this present moment, as a get-rich-quick scheme. But if there is any good news in this text, it is the reminder that what we are experiencing right now is not in your head. It reminds me of another children's story, The Emperor's New Clothes. Love that story. A cunning tailor goes to the castle and swindles the emperor by convincing him he's got this special and expensive thread only visible to those who are important. Tempted by his opportunity to show off his importance, the emperor buys the outfit and takes the invisible suit downtown and the emperor walks around the town naked and proud, convincing everyone that he is draped in the finest fashions. But the, the townspeople begin to look at him weird and say, um, what is going on? And then he says, if you don't see my outfit, it's because there's something wrong with you. Maybe you should get your eyes checked, but this thread is fine thread. And the worst part of the fairy tale is that the people in the town go along with it. And when anyone gets ready to call them out and say there's something wrong with what you're doing, they get shushed by other people who are convinced of the fantasy themselves. 
In different iterations of the story, it is often a child who exclaims, he's naked, y'all. <laughs> and of course, to the embarrassment of their parents, the child is the one to point out the absurdity. Your whole behind is exposed for the world. The entire town had believed that the emperor was really wearing magical clothes, and there is a reason why. Psychologists named this dynamic on behalf of the emperor as gaslighting. It's when someone, who usually has more power than you, finds ways to make you doubt the things that you are witnessing your very self. When someone says to you, why would I lie? forcing you to believe that they are telling you the sky is green, even when you know good and well it isn't. So many of us have been gaslit by the king, but also by people who are close to us. Oh no, baby, that wasn't a flirtatious text that came up on my Apple Watch. That was my cousin. And you know, she said, I love you, and just sent some heart emojis. But yeah, no, that's my cousin. That's nobody to worry about. Are you sure we promised you a raise? We never said we were gonna do that. We never wrote that in writing. I know we said we were gonna codify Roe, but these things take time. And that's why you have to vote for me in November to do the same thing I've been doing all this time if you really want me to do something next time again. Let me tell you that powers and principalities and everyday people will go out of their way to make you believe that everything is fine, but the text tells on itself. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. So if you are beaten down or tired or struggling, please know it is not your fault. This is the design. But the last thing I want you to know that you are not imagining is that there is always a way out. There are always people doing the good work of liberation. Now, I'm so sorry to the person who had to read this text um, today. Truly, truly, my friend. Because it's hard to find good news in this text. It's Pride Sunday after all. I know a good number of folks are heading downtown. I promise I will not send you down there downtrodden and gloomy. But I wanna ask you to consider that later on in the story, beyond these passages, beyond this passage, we hear the story of how Moses was born. And this part of the story is often left out. But there are two faithful midwives named Shifra and Pua. And I imagine that maybe one of them had a short buzz cut with a little bit of color. <laughs> And the other had long brown locks all the way down to her back, maybe a few little gold embellishments throughout. Real people, I see them clear as day. And they decided that the oppression was too much. In her book, Womanist Midrash, biblical scholar Dr. Will Gaffney wonders, maybe these two midwives were just the leaders of an entire industry of birth workers. Certainly, we can't imagine that just two people were responsible for all of the births in a given nation. They were likely, perhaps, part of a collective, as birth workers tend to be. Pharaoh added a new law to his plan, just stinky and stinky and stinkier. And he would ask that all children assigned male at birth be executed. If I can pause here. We might talk about the issue of assigning worth and value to the genitals that children are born with. But that might mean that at some point we would have to end our practice of gender reveals. And I'm okay with that too. Pharaoh believed that children assigned male at birth were a threat to the powers. This was his biodeterminist patriarchal logic that if there are no boys and men, which he assumes those children will grow up to be, then there will be no nation. He was wrong. In response to the order from Pharaoh regarding the Hebrew children, 
The two midwives just believed in God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but instead let the children live. Now you may be saying, Minister Simpson, whose side is God on? Like, is God coming to the protest with us or not? Is God for the children to be born or not? I'm saying that God is going to put some people in place, people who are faithful and love their people, people who are discreet and safe and wise to defy the orders that are unjust. You might be one of those people. I'm saying that you get to have control and agency over your body. You get to make decisions about your present and future life. You still need to wear a mask because COVID is highly transmissible and it impacts other people's agency and their health outcomes. And you get to have a health care that helps you have a healthy life. Whether it means you're on the pill, you get an IUD, hopefully with some anesthesia, a vasectomy, and yes, an abortion and beyond. Whether it means the city's gonna pay for your doula, whether you give birth at home or in a birthing center, whether it means you have to take time off from work and you're not gonna worry about how you're gonna pay the mortgage in the meantime, whether you get to raise your children in a neighborhood where the parks are safe and the water is clean, whether you get to trust that those children will leave in the morning and come home safe, empowered, ready to talk your head off about dinosaurs, <laughs> whether the public venues that you frequent require masks and if there are proper air filters in the workplace, whether you can afford to take the train and expect that it drops you off to your destination safely and reliably MTA at any hour. The midwives gave the parents a gift. They allowed them to trust their own hopes. What do you want? What kind of world do you want? I imagine that these midwives whispered to each person in the birthing room, I know what Pharaoh says, but we can help you have what you want. No questions, no judgment. And in that moment, whoever was having that child knew that they were not alone. They had the space, the agency to say for themselves, is this what I want? What the Pharaoh did was strip these parents from their right to ask this question of themselves. Friends, there are going to be policies that the king is already on his way to send out. He's scared of the gay agenda, of the immigrants, of the black folks, the disabled folks, the formerly incarcerated people. He will do anything to squash them. He's gathered his trusted advisors in back rooms and boardrooms and has said, come, let us deal shrewdly. He's deputized vigilantes all across the nation to tell you that you'll be fine if you just vibrate higher. When you have the opportunity, refuse the policies. You get to choose how loudly or how softly you announce it, if at all. Maybe today you will run into Shifra or Pua on the way to the march. I have a feeling like there's at least one or two or 17 in this room presently. <laughs> Only you know what your role is, what your gift is. I can hear echoes of the wisdom of ancients, wisdom telling us that no matter what, we shall trust in the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is, present tense, the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Even when the wicked in their robes come against me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. 
The psalmist says, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in the Lord's temple. Whatever it is, however you decide to engage, no matter who you are, when you look out across at this land, remember this one thing. You may be a puny ant, but you outnumber the grasshoppers 100 to 1. And they know that. You are not imagining it. Amen.